four million years later. Hi there, thank you for downloading and listening to the 4 Million Years Later podcast, a show where two old friends, two Gen Xer friends, get together and watch an episode of the Generation 1 Transformers cartoon series in story order, and then get together and talk about what they saw. We are lifelong fans, we grew up with the show, we loved it as children, we loved it as teenagers, we loved it as young adults, and now we love it as older adults. My (laughs) name is Jersey Drozd, I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is named... Hoover. Oh, is that like the traitor? <laughs> yeah, it's not Hoover. It's Hoover. Okay. <laughs> it only took me four hours to come up with that. <laughs> that was pretty brilliant. That's, that's almost as bad as like a first wave Beast Wars name. <laughs> <laughs> look, it's Insecticon. Oh, look, he's battling Dinobot. Oh. <laughs> this guy's called Tarantulas. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what he turns into. <laughs> and yet they didn't name a single character Bumblebee. Anyway, <laughs> we are slowly going through the series in story order. So if you're following along at 2B.TV, this will not be the next episode after the last episode, which was... Attack of the Autobots. <laughs> so first we have the Autobots go rogue and wreck up the place. And now we get another episode where an Autobot goes mm-hmm. rogue. This is Traitor. Traitor by George Hampton and Mike Moore. Yeah, we haven't heard those names before. Both seem to be primarily known for episodes of The Get Along Gang, Thundercats, Mm. Mm. and the Dennis the Menace animated series. And this is their only Transformers episode. Interesting. You know, this is like real brief, 10,000 foot up. This is a solid episode. Very, very solid. I have a lot of memories of watching the show as a child. I never would have ranked it as like a top 15 or anything. It's like, yeah, it's a good Mm. one. Yeah. But watching it again, I was like, man, there there aren't very many weak points in this, and the animation is pretty good. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. It checks a lot of my boxes off. Again, it's like you said, I've never really thought about it as, oh, this is one of my favorites. But it's got, like, everything I look for in an episode, really. It's like, well, I'm looking at my checklist. I'm like, well, that was there, that was there, that was there, that was there. So, yeah. yeah. have to sort of bump it up, in my opinion, in my mind. Yeah, for real. Okay, well, then let's just dive in and, like, talk about what happens in this episode. And I'll resort to the oft-quoted imdb.com to get our log line. Here we go. The Decepticons steal the electro cells from the research center and... (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm stop right there. From the research center, the <laughs> research center, the only one. <laughs> uh, so they, they steal the electro cells from the research center and plan to use them to create energon cubes. When Mirage tries to stop them on his own, Cliffjumper begins to think that Mirage is a Decepticon spy. This is where you insert the dun dun dun. 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 <laughs> <laughs> what am I predictable now? <laughs> okay, the truth is I've basically filtered all these episodes into a machine that's creating an AI program that can replace me. Yeah, it looks like Corky the furniture maker's machine on Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how does this one start? Well, the episode opens on a shot of a building. And the building reads, Experimental Energy Research Laboratory. Mm. And inside we see two scientists celebrating the development of electrocells, which promise to solve the world's energy problems if they can be stabilized. Mm. So since these scientists have just made something that generates energy, there's a knock on the door. And by knock on the door, I mean Skywarp is punching through the roof. (laughs) Pull back to see he and Starscream literally tearing the roof off the place as Starscream exclaims that these electro cells will make a great present for Megatron. He reaches inside and swats a scientist away, but then Megatron lands on the roof and warns Starscream to stop. Electro cells are too ticklish to withstand your heavy handed mauling. That's kind of cute language there from a tyrannical conqueror. Yeah, it's 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 a little bit more like lilting dialogue than what we typically get with Megatron, right? <laughs> then Megatron reaches in and retrieves the entire device, which the two scientists cling to as he lifts it out of the hole in the roof. They soon fall back down into the building, warning him that the electro cells are unstable. 
Megatron gingerly hands the device over to Skywarp and instructs Starscream to ensure no more Electro Cells will be made. Megatron transforms to gun mode and lands in Starscream's hand as he begins shooting, shooting, and shooting down into the building. We then see the two scientists running for their lives out the front doors, so they survived. <laughs> although, although this is like a giant research facility with lots and lots of windows, right. presumably there's other people <laughs> there. But really, the only people we need to know about are the two people we've seen. So there, there's your lesson, children, is like the two people you've seen, those are the only ones worth caring about. <laughs> Then Megatron returns to robot mode as Skywar pants him back the electro cell generator, which is roughly the size of, say, a bicycle tire if we and it were blown up to Decepticon scale. Mm -hmm. The jets transform and head back to base with Megatron, who declares that they've begun the first chapter in the book of Decepticon Supremacy. That's a good line. That's not a bad line. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, I, I know another reason you like this episode. There's quite a bit of Skywarp stuff going on in this one. Like. Mm -hmm. The episode kicks off with the first Transformer we see yep. is Skywarp, and he's like ripping a building apart. And he's like, oh, I just love it open in presents. And that's where Starscream <laughs> gets the line where he's like, oh, this will make a great present for Megatron. I also like that, like the opening line. It's like, okay, well, we don't have Victor Caroli, so now we got to have these two scientists be like, ah, we've sure made some great energy cells. Isn't that right? Yes, and these energy cells are they're going to be a gift to mankind, but they're so unstable, they could destroy the world. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> the the Septicon starts smashing again. And also the design of the electro cell machine is like, it's very fluoro dairy. It's all swooshy and round with lots mm -hmm. of like little monitors and, and gigas sticking off the side. But then it's, it's like, it's bright green as compared to everything else in the room. So you can tell who has it at any given time. Like when Skywarp's mm -hmm. holding it and then when Skywarp gives it back to Megatron, it's like, look for the big green bicycle tire. <laughs> but also this is like Megatron's like Starscream. I don't want you handling that thing. Skywarp, you can hold it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just a little a little addition, but it's a nice slight towards Starscream, and that you know checks off another box on my list. Yep, there we go. So where do we go from here? Then we cut to the outside of Ottawa HQ, where we see Cliff Jumper speeding in. Uh-oh. Yeah. He pulls up to a crew of Autobots and tells Prime that he's located the missing Electro Cells. Prime's glad to hear this, and he wonders where. In the same area Mirage patrolled yesterday. Impossible! I'd have picked up a reading on them for sure! Maybe you did, but decided to keep it quiet. That'll do, Cliffjumper. We don't want bad feelings, just the Electro Cells. So Prime gives the order for everyone to transform, and the assembled Autobots, who also include Sunstreaker, Prowl, Blue Streak, and Ironhide, all roll out. So Cliffjumper is basically accusing Mirage of, at the least, withholding information, but essentially being a traitor. And where is this notion coming from? We've seen no real shred of this characteristic before in the animated series, but where it comes from is the original tech specs that were the short bios that came with the toys. Mirage's bio reads, Mirage is not thrilled about being an Autobot freedom fighter, prefers hunting turbo foxes on Cybertron with his high-priced friends. Effective fighter, more effective intelligence gatherer. Electro disruptor can cast illusions altering his physical placement and appearance for up to six minutes. I love that there's like a timer <laughs> on it. I, I love that so much. Expert marksman with armor piercing rocket dart hunting rifle. Unsure of Autobot cause. Can't be fully trusted. Aha! So this is a seed that was initially planted on the tech spec and virtually ignored by the show writers until now. Writers of the show played kind of fast and loose with the info on the tech specs, basically just using what they liked and ignoring what they didn't. But here we see an attempt to adhere to a continuity, which I really like. So let's see where they take it. So also, like, the, this line in here... And again, you know, we keep coming at this idea like Sunbow cartoons always offer just enough to start imagining, but they never deliver on the promise. And here's another instance where like the toy itself is doing it is he prefers hunting turbo foxes on Cybertron with his high priced friends that instantly conjures an image in your head. Right. Mm -hmm. So you instantly see like James Spader from Pretty in Pink in your head, like that kind of character. And then and then so I get wondering, like, OK, well, that must have been why. At least I, I suppose my Frank Welker would choose to try to play like a Gregory Peck 
kind of voice for Mirage. Not that Gregory Peck necessarily is instantly equated with snobbiness, but he's certainly like what you think of him as an actor who's like very it's kind of actor. high class. Yeah, a little bit, right? Like, I mean, for crying out loud, he played like a high ranking government official in The Omen. Anyway, things start to make more sense now, right? Because like mm-hmm. when I was a kid, all I knew was that Mirage was the guy who was always talking like his mouth was full. Why is he always talking like that? And now we know. It's starting to finally make a little bit of sense. But yeah, all we got so far was, for someone who doesn't like to fight, you're not bad, Mirage. Which, mm-hmm. who said that? Who said that? Cliff Jumper said that. Yeah. Yeah. So, but like all of a sudden now, it's like, yeah, I don't know where Cliff Jumper's just like, oh, I got a problem with you now. Well... This is part of that whole like entering the story midway thing that I personally enjoy, but I understand why it would bother a lot of people. And not only does it bother a lot of people, but like if you're pitching a graphic novel, don't start your story midway. Editors don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Sounds like you have some personal experience there. <laughs> See you past episode. I talked about this a little bit. Uh, I think I think actually it was Heavy Metal War <laughs> where we talked quite a bit about it. Anyway. So where do we go from here? We cut to the Decepticons where they've clearly adapted the electrocell generator to some nice purple Decepticon technology. And we're looking at roughly like maybe a kilometer long device out in the desert valley somewhere. So Megatron just likes to build his stuff like where there's lots of room like in the outdoors. Yeah. Like, oh, there's some empty dirt. I'll I'll go build my stuff out there. Yeah. Maybe he would get away with a lot more of his plans if he like built a roof over them so the Autobots <laughs> couldn't like plainly see them. You know, there's caves, Megatron. I've seen them. <laughs> He's like, yes, but you know, I want to get my vitamin D. You know, it's, it's, it's a bright day. Megatron just loves sunbathing. Well, I mean, it, it could be that like they all have solar chargers on them in some way, and Megatron's mm. all about right, like 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 maintaining your energy. You know, whatever little bit you can get is a good thing. <laughs> that could Makes very sense. well be, but. <laughs> so Megatron has a plan here. So that means somebody's got some notes on the plan. Guess who? Why do you delay, Megatron? Transferred to the Energon cubes by now, and the Autobots destroyed if I were in charge. But I am in charge, Starscream, and until I am sure that this failsafe monitor device works, I will not risk the electro cells exploding. Where is the courage your leadership demands, Megatron? To discover if something works, you must dare to test it. And with that, he pushes some buttons on the console. Megatron calls him a fool and declares he'll destroy them all. But somehow the energy exchange goes off without a hitch, and the Energon cubes fill. Starscream gloats, until Megatron says, Look again! As the Energon drains from the cubes, and an explosion knocks both Starscream and Megatron off their feet. There's a really nice shot here. So we talked in past episodes about how, like, even if there's like low frame rate animation, one of the things that they do in the early Transformers episodes is they stage the shots really well. So like the composition's really good, the viewing angle's really good, and the characters are like really, really close to on model. Mm-hmm. So it just looks so nice. You don't even notice that they're not moving very smoothly. But like when start, they, there's this a shot where after Starscream hits the button, it cuts to we're looking again. This is something that in episodes like City of Steel, they don't do this as much. We see Megatron from behind. We're looking, Starscream's off to the lower left of the screen, and Megatron's in the close to the right side of the screen, and we're watching him from behind as he's backing away from the machine as it's starting to activate. Mm -hmm. It's just a couple seconds, but it looks so good and also telegraphs the fact that Megatron's like, without him saying, like, I'm very nervous about what's happening with this machine. He doesn't have to. His body Mm -hmm. just does it. And then when it cuts to him saying, like, oh, yeah, look again, you know, it's like he can say that with that kind of confidence because he's far away from it now. Yet, when the Energon cubes drain, it feels like almost anticlimactic for Mo because it's like they fill up, whoop, and then Mm -hmm. Megatron's like, look again. They go, ooh. (laughs) <laughs> You're like, oh, is that all that's going to happen? And then it explodes, and they both get knocked down. It's a pretty cool-looking scene. I liked it a lot. And then Megatron stands up, and he calmly walks over to Starscream and says, This time you have dared too much, Starscream. You must pay the price for your insolence. As we see Megatron aiming his fusion cannon at Starscream, who has his mouth agape in terror. 
And then we cut to the Autobots. Yeah, the, part of me wants to set a stopwatch here. Because, like, okay, <laughs> he's got his gun trained on Starscream, and he's, like, saying, I'm going to punish you. We cut to the Autobots, which are doing what? <laughs> we see them pulling up with an eyesight of Megatron's big purple device as Prime orders they transform. Only now, Ratchet is with them, and Sunstreaker, Prowl, and Blue Streak are not seen. <laughs> I guess they got lost. <laughs> Sunstreaker tried to find his own shortcut. He's like, well, I'm going to do what my brother did, after all. <laughs> oh, we're in a cave. How did we get here? <laughs> that is weird that they were at the beginning of the episode, and now they're just no longer to be seen. I mean, they must have been called out in the script, right? You'd think. I don't know how this works. Huh. <laughs> I don't it obviously doesn't work is the issue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Prime's bunch are spotted by Laserbeak, who flies back to Soundwave. Prime orders the team to retrieve the Electro Cells, as Soundwave warns everyone that the Autobots are here, causing Megatron to hit the pause button on murdering Starscream. And he tells Soundwave that the Insecticons are nearby, and basically has Soundwave tell them that there's some Energon goodies in it for them if they get involved in all this. This is a cool shot. Like, there's some really nice shots here. First of all, like, there's the parts of the Autobots. They, they, so they come up to Megatron's device, like, over, like, a hill or, like, a, a cliff. Kind yeah. Of like a, well, I would say, like, a bluff. It's a high outcropping of rock that they're all peeking over. And then when Optimus says, like, orders the charge, they all start, like, sliding down the hill. And it looks <laughs> really nice the way they, they stage those shots. But then when Laserbeak flies back in a sound wave, he turns around starts running. And you hear him saying, like, you know, like, prepare for counterattack, Autobot alert. But it's just a shot of his feet running at the camera right mm -hmm. and again it's not you know early disney animation but it's staged in just such a way that it's like well i've never seen that before i've never seen a shot of just the ground coming at me as soundwave's feet are stomping on the ground why do that why choose that shot instead of something else right because mm -hmm. it's, it's dynamic it looks exciting and interesting and it's not like looking at his feet run sideways across the room. He's running at us. He's running directly at us. So the artist in me gets very excited when you see shots like that. But but the other thing I've, I said about like wanting to set a stopwatch is that Megatron's been holding his gun at Starscream's face this entire time. It's been like a good like 15 seconds, right? Well, you know so how Megatron likes to talk. <laughs> I'm sure he's like, you know, when I started this team back in the day, I figured I was going to have to shoot you someday. <laughs> got this or long soliloquy. Or yeah, he's he's telling Starscream all the things he's going to do with his body parts afterwards. <laughs> and then I'm going to turn your arm into a gun on top of a building. <laughs> but yeah, who knows? And so now it seems like we're going to get the second appearance of the Insecticons. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the last time we saw them, Megatron was chasing them with the intent to destroy them. <laughs> so clearly there's been a bit of patching up off screen. Not enough to get them working full time for Megatron, but somewhere in the middle of shoot on sight and work for me yeah because he did say specifically there's a special reward in it for them which mm -hmm. i mean so they don't just take his orders they're contract employees they're 1099 <laughs> contract employees good way to put it <laughs> <laughs> they don't get the benefits of room and board and health care plan in decepticon <laughs> decepticon town under the sea <laughs> but but they do get they're just day laborers yeah 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 <laughs> Now, as I've stated before, I really like the dichotomy here that, that there's Decepticons who aren't really interested in the war. But they just want to eat and be left alone and to not have any responsibilities other than finding their next meal. Yeah. So now that the Autobots have been spotted, Prime orders everyone attack. And now we see Jazz with the group. So they're really playing fast and loose with what Autobots are actually here. <laughs> but definitely here are Cliffjumper and Mirage who rush into battle. Try and remember which side you're on, Mirage. Keep your mind on the Decepticons, Cliffjumper. That's just what I'm doing. So we now have the Autobots squaring off against Decepticons as Cliffjumper scales the side of Megatron's huge machine in order to retrieve the Electro Cells. But he's stopped by Starscream. Didn't you ever learn not to touch things that don't belong to you? Okay, Optimus, jump him now! Optimus Prime, where? Ah! Poor Starscream. The oldest tricks only work on the biggest jerks. Now this is pretty interesting because it was only two episodes ago that Starscream got rammed in the back by Bumblebee after Gears warned him to look behind him. 
And Starscream retorted, Do you really think I'm so stupid to believe that? So Starscream learned from his mistake, only this time Cliff Jumper is fibbing, so no one's really here. <laughs> but Starscream diverts his attention long enough to allow Cliff Jumper to get the drop on him and shoot him, sending Starscream toppling to the ground. There's a couple of neat animation notes that I wanted to point out here. So like when Cliff Jumper's saying, like, hey, try to remember which side you're on, Mirage, that the cuts to a shot of Optimus running, and this time we're looking at him straight on from the side, but like he's instead of doing the thing where they just like kind of bounce the cell up and down to show that he's running, he's actually like you see his shoulders moving. Like you can see that he's actually in a run cycle. Mm-hmm. And then also the shot of Mirage and Cliff Jumper running together is a cool three quarter down shot where like it, it, they're just they're really really on model they look they look terrific, but then also the shot of when Cliff Jumper takes out Starscream. There's a lot of looking down the barrels of guns in this one too. Mm-hmm. I noticed like that shot happens a lot. The Starscream's holding Cliff Jumper at gunpoint, but then when Cliff Jumper takes Starscream out, it's a really nice shot of like looking up at the the energy device that Cliff Jumper's standing on after he knocks Starscream down to the ground. So. Just cool little storyboarding moments to watch out for if you really want to appreciate this one. Mm -hmm. So then we see Mirage and Skywarp get into a lengthy grappling match where Mirage eventually wrestles Skywarp to the ground. But the Insecticons then show up and start firing at them, creating an explosion that sends Mirage flying off of him. Though in the process, he's managed to rip off one of Skywarp's Decepticon signals. Uh oh, Skywarp, better head to toyhacks.com for all your repro label needs. Available now on toyhacks.com. We haven't seen like a whole lot of grappling in this show, right? Like a little yeah. bit between Optimus and Megatron, a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then there's like that awkward fight between Hound and Rumble in More Than Meets the Eye Part 3, right? Mm-hmm. Where they're just like punching each other in the chest and grunting. <laughs> but like this feels like full on wrestling that's happening yeah. right here. And like there's actually like, a little bit of banter between, I wouldn't call maybe not banter, but more like just like grunting and slight retorts between Skywarp and Mirage, which I had no memory of. Like I, I remember a lot of parts of this episode, but I completely forgot about that. Like I couldn't remember where Mirage got that Decepticon symbol piece of cloth or whatever mm-hmm. it's like the paint and the decepticons is so thick that if you rip it off it looks like cloth <laughs> no, it's just but, a big sticker sheet that they all put on, each, <laughs> on themselves but yeah this is another cool scene that like i just i hadn't i hadn't thought about in a long time so yeah it's a good looking episode and more skywarp yep. who knew i had it in my head that skywarp was largely out of the picture by this point mm-hmm. me too and I love the guy. Yeah. And also, I'm noticing that the music is largely taken from the first season's soundtrack as well. There's only one part of the episode where we hear the new season two sort of like, mm-hmm. uh, again, I, I don't know what to call it. The music that gets shared between it and G.I. Joe. Mm-hmm. But like a lot of the Transformers anthemic stuff is in this one. So that's nice, too. I think that's mm-hmm. another thing that adds up to this one being so solid. Hmm. Yeah, I would agree. So now we switch to Prime and Megatron who are squaring off, and while the pair argue over the Electro Cells, Kickback flies by and shoots Prime, (laughs) causing Prime to barrel over onto the ground at Megatron's feet. (laughs) Seems a bit overpowered for Kickback here, but but okay. If there's one thing we've learned about the Insecticons is that they're weirdly overpowered, so I guess this sort of checks out. Yeah, I was, I was trying to like retcon that one in my head because like Optimus has taken a, a full on shot in the chest from a lot of things from the uh, what was that super gun on the top of the tower or the top of the temple in um, Fire in the Mountain. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. Optimus and Ironhide are like taking full on hits from that. Right. And it's like it's like, oh, that's OK. But then, oh, <laughs> don't let kickback shoot you. I mean, seriously, well, well, he's so small. I'm, just watch out. Because if he shoots you, you will go down. Even you, Omega, be careful. <laughs> but I, I, I was just like, maybe he hit him at the right angle, or maybe he like caught him unaware. I don't know. But like, he shoots him, and just goes like, bing, on his chest. He's like, oh, and he falls <laughs> on the ground. <laughs> and he's like reaching for Megatron's leg. <laughs> so Shrapnel flies in, and he attacks Cliff Temper. But Cliff Temper starts hopping around, so Shrapnel can't get a good bead on him. And then one of Shrapnel's blasts hits Megatron's machine causing a big explosion and chain reaction. Megatron exclaims that the electrocells are going to explode, and we go into our first commercial break. Oh, uh, so yes, Megatron says, forget the Autobots, protect the cells. Mm-hmm. And they go running after them. 
and the cells is like once again it looks like i don't even know how you describe it it's like this just like this giant row of like computer terminals that are all in purple but then there's like these like exhaust ports at the top or something like that they mm -hmm. look like like almost like um an hvac system and there's like mm -hmm. this weird yellow light coming out of all of the ports and then like electricity is crackling all over it but yeah that's our first commercial break huh yeah, here we are. I mean, we could pour ourselves another bowl of crispy critter cereal with that. Uh, <laughs> surely not not at all infringing on anybody's likeness mascot who isn't at all like, hello, Mrs. Calabash, or good night, Mrs. Calabash, wherever you are. Who would want to eat something called crispy critter cereal? That's what I want to know. <laughs> hello, my name is Crispy. How do you do? Crispy critter cereal. Uh, okay, fine. If you don't want to eat crispy critter cereal, how about nerd cereal? Because there's two flavors <laughs> per box. And surely that excessive packaging isn't infringing on the amount of cereal that you're going to get per box. <laughs> Not that we care as children, because all we know is it turns the milk purple. End of story. <laughs> That's all we need. Nerd cereal is the fruity good part of your complete breakfast. Which side are you gonna eat first? Which side are you gonna eat first? Also available in grape and strawberry. Nerd -nerd -nerd -nerd. <laughs> <laughs> But if you don't want to have a balanced breakfast, then you could resort to just a big bag of Reese's Pieces and have this <laughs> weird blue alien with a big fur diaper show up at your house <laughs> to tell you how much he enjoys them. He's not meant to remind you of anybody else, by the way. No, of course not. <laughs> you want Reese's Pieces, do you? Ah, Reese's Pieces. <laughs> So before we infringe on any other possible copyrights, we better get back to the show. Okay. So as we return, Megatron's machine is crackling with energy as static lightning bolts are emitted from it. Megatron orders that they forget the Autobots and save the Electro Cells! And then Megatron runs up and uses his fusion cannon to emit nitrogen to smother the flames. Okay. That's the first we've seen of that ability. I think he stole Ironhide's power chip rectifier. <laughs> I was wondering where I left that. <laughs> it's a pretty plot-centric uh, thing to do there, but okay. If Ironhide can do it, I gotta allow that Megatron can do it as well. So now, taking advantage of Megatron's distraction, Prime runs up to check on Mirage. Mirage says he's okay, and Prime orders a retreat, saying that they can't risk further combat around the Electro Cells. Tells Megatron that they'll be back and they can count on that. The line is actually bank on it. And mm -hmm. this episode has a couple lines that like as a child, I started to like pick up on this language going like, I don't know what that means, but I need to find out, <laughs> you know, because like if, if Optimus said it, then it must be something that grown ups say. And it's very important to know these words. <laughs> so, I mean, this is something that I don't know if you did this, but like this is one of those things where when we were kids, comics were considered still very much junk literature. I mean, it's much, much less so today, but it was certainly widely accepted back then that mm -hmm. comics were junk literature. And we've talked before about how these cartoons were largely criticized by various adult parent groups because like, oh, it's just a commercial for toys. One of the arguments that I made as a kid and well into my adulthood is that like, I don't know, I mean, like, it seems like my vocabulary improved a lot by reading comics because I would mm -hmm. encounter these words and I'd be like, I don't know what poltroon is. Do you? You know, well, time to go look at the dictionary. So, like, <laughs> these shows and those books actually made me consult my dictionary a lot more than any, like, well-meaning adult could have at the time, you know? Totally. So, like, that idiom of the uh, idiomatic expression of, like, bank on it. I'm like, banking on it? What am I banking on something? You know, and so then I'm, like, asking the adults in my life, and I'm looking at the dictionary. What does that mean? Oh, okay, well, it means that you're investing in the idea. Okay, yes, you can you can count on this happening. So, <laughs> it's not like coming up that I grabbed onto as a child, too, but we'll get there. Learning. <laughs> You know, I almost apologize for it. I'm not going to apologize for it, you know. <laughs> I am who I am. So now we cut back to the Ark, and Ratchet is fixing up Mirage, and Cliffjumper is ranting that they would have had the cells yesterday if Mirage had reported them. Mirage defends himself, but Cliffjumper is dead certain that Mirage is to blame, beating this dead horse over and over, causing Prime to step in. Hold on, Cliffjumper. 
Until you can back your remarks with proof, I'll take Mirage's word. Now, I want you to go to the ridge and maintain surveillance of those electro cells. If the Decepticons try to move them, I want to know about it at once. You can depend on me, Prime. Yeah, so this is... I mean, like, if we were to find, like, like the, the, the wholesomeness in the episode, this is, like, great modeling behavior, right? Because, like, when you're kids, all you have is your own experience to go on. Your experience might be your entire world, right? Mm -hmm. It might as well be, right? So what you see and what you think is absolutely the truth. And when parents say, well, there's more than one side of this thing, it's like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I saw it. <laughs> there's not more than one side. There's just this. There's just this experience I have. I'm the common denominator. Therefore, my interpretation of reality is reality. So this is one of those things as an adult, I, as I re-encounter the show, I really like this aspect of Optimus being like, and, and this isn't as heavy handed as it could have been. Like it could have been much more, you know, but it's just like, it's just a quick line. Like until I get Mirage's side, or rather like until you have proof, I don't want to hear any more about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just solidifies Prime as, you know, the wise boss. You know, he's, he's not going to unjustly accuse anyone of anything. Yeah, but he but he similarly is not going to hold a grudge against Cliff Jumper for being out of line here either. He's like, okay, if we, well, now that we've got that out of the way, you know, like <laughs> don't say that again unless you got proof. And by the way, here's the thing I want you to do: he's not going to put Cliff Jumper in the corner. You know? <laughs> well, then Ratchet tells Mirage to relax and rest up, as we see he still has Skywarp's sticker wadded up in his fist. Mirage exclaims that he doesn't need rest. He like whispers it to himself, which is all <laughs> mysterious and weird. Like R Ratchet walks away. He's like, "Yeah, put mm -hmm. your, put put your axle up," is what he says. <laughs> Whatever that means, uh, put your axle up and, and rest a while. I'll check on you later. He's like, "I don't need rest." What, and he, then he opens his hand. That Decepticon symbol is there. Now, watching this as an adult, does that seem foreboding at all to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it means he's definitely got some ideas in mind. But like as a kid, as a kid, I remember that feeling like, oh, he is going to do like joining the Decepticons. Like Cliff mm. Jumper's right. As an adult, I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, like visually, it's like it's a cool image of him opening his hand. And he still has the symbol, but like it doesn't directly point to anything as far as I know that like that he's actually bad. Right. right. Like, up to this point, he's done exactly zero bad things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But for some reason, that worked on my little kid brain. I was like, oh, that means he's up to something. So I guess that's all you got to do in kids' literature is just have somebody be like, oh, I'm not hungry in <laughs> a scary voice. <laughs> and they're like, oh, he's up to something. He really is hungry. <laughs> so the scene changes, and we cut back to Mirage, who has decided to be a bit more proactive, and he's pulled up to conduct some unfinished business. He sneaks inside what I guess is a sort of temporary Decepticon headquarters. Boy, ever since those Constructicons showed up, there's been a lot of temporary bases. And Mirage spies on the Insecticons, complaining that Megatron's only paid them two Energon cubes. Or rather, Bombshell is complaining. Kickback says, I'd say that's pretty good. <laughs> okay, can we talk about how you have gotten so much mileage out of this line over the years that, that I've known you? This has been quoted a lot in our conversation. <laughs> well, here we see Kickback is easily contented. <laughs> right on, buddy. You were my first Insecticon toy for a reason. <laughs> I just like that dichotomy. It's like some Decepticons are power hungry. It's like I must have all the Energon cubes, and you know, you just give kickback two, yeah, that he has to share with two other people, and he's like, oh, "That's not bad." <laughs> all we had to do was shoot Prime once and fly around. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Like you think about like cost benefit analysis. <laughs> right. The more and more I engage with this, the more I love the the, the whole concept behind the Insecticons. In that they are, like you said, they're not interested in the war. They're their own thing. They're just sort of like a gang. They're like mm -hmm. a gang of little toughs, and they're like little too, right? They're yep. like su substantially smaller than everybody else. But they're so much more adaptable and crafty. And it just just think about what would happen if Bombshell or Shrapnel decided that they had any ambition. <laughs> what could happen then, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, not kickback because you, you throw a couple of cubes and he's like, "Hey, look at me!" <laughs> <laughs> it, it reminds me of like when I was in, like when I was nineteen and or like eighteen or whatever. No, I, I had to be even younger. My, I got my first like part time job when I was in high school, and like I got my first paycheck. 
like from an institution and it was like a, it was over you know whatever it was over fifty dollars you know but like in my <laughs> mind it was like i'm gonna mm-hmm. i'm driving down the street going like i'm gonna have two of those and three of those and four of those mm-hmm. you know i might as well have been bill gates <laughs> so poor kickback he's just like a 17 year old with a part-time job <laughs> <laughs> And then the two Insecticons leave to watch TV or something taking place outside of the room because Mirage just uses his invisibility powers to sneak right in, steal the Energon cubes, and leave behind Skywarp's ripped-off sigil as a red herring. Mm. Invisible, he carries out the Energon cubes looking like Strong Bad did when he stole all the Swiss cake rolls from Bub's concession stand in his email, Invisibility. My chocolates! Come back, chocolates! I didn't mean what I said. And then Mirage speeds off with the Energon cubes, driving off to Megatron's energy generator. But that's where Prime sent Cliffjumper. So Cliffjumper seeing Mirage roll up with Energon cubes. Yeah, he, Mirage transforms and like throws the cubes up in the air, and then they land in his like open seat because he's like a <laughs> what, Formula One race car mm-hmm. and drives off. And I and I, w- I was like that image too of like just like him driving around with Energon cubes in his passenger compartment. Mm-hmm. And so naturally, Cliffjumper seeing this assumes the worst and takes aim at Mirage, but he's then interrupted by the sound of the Insecticons flying above him. On the ground, we see that Mirage is glad to see his plan working already. First the Decepticons reward us, then they rob us! We'll take back our Energon cubes and more! So Mirage turns invisible and hides, causing Cliffjumper to lose sight of him, literally. In the meantime, Starscream gets the drop on Cliffjumper, but the incoming Insecticons distract Starscream just long enough for Cliffjumper to duke boys into him, (laughs) knocking him over and onto the ground. And there's some really good animation here while he's doing that. Yeah, you can really feel the impact the way they animated it, like the the way he like darts into Starscream's chest and drives over his face (laughs) and drives away. (laughs) It's it's a really nice looking shot, and it's another one where like I mean. it doesn't take much, but all you do is you just angle the shot just a little bit. And like going back to like our problems with episodes like City of Steel, it's like they either do it on the horizontal or it's a security camera three quarter down shot. But you angle that shot just a little bit, like turn the horizon at just like slightly off kilter. And suddenly it just feels so much more energetic. And then, yeah, it's it's low frame rate stuff, but everybody's on model. It looks really good. And when Cliffjumper impacts Starscream, they animate it in such a way where you feel that impact. It looks really mm-hmm. great. Also, the shot when Cliffjumper is contemplating having to fire on Mirage, he's like, oh, I've never willingly fired on another Autobot, but Mirage is no longer one of us. You're looking down the barrel of his gun, like rather, actually, you start looking out the barrel of his gun, then you're looking through the barrel of his gun when he loses mm-hmm. Mirage, like, where'd he go? And then when Starscream is pointing at him, we're looking down the barrel of Starscream's gun as he's pointing at Cliffjumper. So there's like, again, <laughs> that shot just happens again and again in this one. And I don't know why. I'm wondering if there one storyboard artist did most of this stuff or what, but <laughs> but anyway, so like he he hits Starscream in the face, and then drives off, and then <laughs> having heard all this commotion, Megatron comes out to see just what Starscream was firing at. Starscream exclaims that there was an Autobot spy, and Megatron insults him for missing the shot. Now, is there an irony here in that Starscream missed shooting Cliff Jumper? Mm, maybe. <laughs> I don't think they were going for that symmetry no. in the writing. <laughs> but in our fan end, <laughs> something to point out. You shouldn't have missed, you mean, Starscream. <laughs> but then they see Mirage hiding behind a rock, and both Starscream and Megatron fire at him, but their blasts pass him, coincidentally landing at the Insecticon's feet. Coincidentally, I read that as, as Mirage was intentionally trying to get them to fire. Yeah, but I mean, Megatron and Starscream weren't intentionally shooting at the Insecticons. Ah, I see. So from their perspective, it was coincidental, but Mm -hmm. this is exactly what Mirage was after. Exactly. Because when I watched the scene again, I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you becoming visible again? It's like, (laughs) oh, I see, I see. Okay, yeah, so you're just trying to get them to shoot at the the other bad guys. Mm -hmm. So this really solidifies the idea in the Insecticon's head that the Decepticons are ripping them off. And then we get this exclamation. On us, us. It's the Decepticon ambush. What? What was that? 
Now, if that first line sounded odd to you, very astute. That is actually shrapnel talking, but it didn't get mechanically altered and pitched up as it usually is. So you're getting a rare glimpse of what How Rail sounds like before they alter his voice. Really? That was How Rail? I thought for sure that was Wally Burr like doing like a drop-in line that How Rail was supposed to finish. Mm, maybe, but clearly they did not put yeah. a mechanical alteration on onto it. Yeah, you, it doesn't have all that weird warping that goes on and all like the mechanical tinny sounds, but... Yeah, and that made it into the final cut, because I remember mm-hmm. that line throwing me off when I videotaped it off the television as a kid. Mm-hmm. And there's like one more line in an upcoming episode where somebody, like I think it's like, is it Ratchet or Ironhide, says, yeah, they sure used to give us, oh no, it's Thundercrackers. Yeah. They sure used to give us a pounding back in the And that movie. was Wally Burr. Okay, so we'll have to like compare back and forth and see which one it sounds like. But either way, it's like the vocal effects are gone just for like a split second and then like they start saying attack fight back and it's like okay they're back to being insecticons again <laughs> yeah. so i guess like just got a frog in their throat just very very briefly <laughs> yep <laughs> so now everyone has the wrong idea and the insecticons and decepticons are attacking each other mirage has a good laugh as the insecticons strafe megatron who orders the decepticons into battle Kickback kicks Skywarp to the ground, and Shrapnel unleashes his two-on-the-nose, but what else can you call it, Shrapnel Cannon, <laughs> Skywarp's way. But he actually hits the invisible Mirage, who becomes visible and then collapses. Surprised by the Autobot's presence, it's time for Bombshell to show that he's also OP like the other Insecticons. He fires a Cerebro shell at Mirage's head which will put Mirage under Bombshell's control. He instructs Mirage to fire his missile at the retreating Skywarp, <laughs> and he does, <laughs> hitting the poor Seeker dead on. Like He, he like nails him in the back, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, you see Skywarp literally like running away, and the <laughs> missile just follows him and pl- <laughs> blows up on his back. Yeah, like he's like kind of on fire for a second, then he just like falls down. <laughs> And Bombshell has a good laugh at this, thinking things are about to get very enjoyable. It's a cool shot, like, closing in right on Bombshell's face. And this is our second commercial break. Yeah. Bombshell has a really interesting face, too. Like, when you get that really big close-up of it, like, how his eyes are not, like, clear holes the way they are on the other Transformers' faces, they appear to be big holes that are obscured by his mouth guard. So mm-hmm. you have to wonder how big his eyes really are. You know, it makes him look that much creepier. Mm-hmm. Also, I mean, like, one of the things we talked about in a previous episode was, is like, one of the things I look for in a Transformers episode is, like, hold up how the Decepticons' internal dynamic is dysfunctional and the Autobots is more functional, but always improving they're always learning and always growing to work better right and that's where the humans come in the humans always help them make better decisions whereas the decepticons are perpetually dysfunctional and they never address it like like megatron (laughs) tries to address it i'm I'm gonna murder starscream now one two oh the autobots are attacking i guess i'll have to hold it off till next time you know But this one, it feels even more balanced that way because we have the dysfunction happening in the Autobots in the whole thing with Cliffjumper and Mirage, and we have a a, a similar sort of track with the Decepticons in that they don't trust each other, right? Mm -hmm. And that can easily be manipulated to make them, like, try to kill each other. (laughs) But then as soon as they smell the trap, they're like, okay, well, let's team up after all. Well, actually, that's not going to happen yet, because on this break, I think the, the, the plan is they're going to use, they just use Mirage to, like, attack the Decepticons, so now they just, like, improve their ranks. Right. So still, we have more of that ongoing dysfunction with the Decepticons. So, oh, man, all this talk about function and dysfunction. <laughs> what kind of wonderful products or services are going to be flashed in my face to make me forget about all my problems and just think about spending the almighty dollar? <laughs> Well, it's such an exciting episode. I, I just need to calm down for a few minutes, so I'm just going to take a little nap with my glowworm doll. Mmm. Music is called glowworm will play a tune for us to go to sleep to. Night, 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 sleep time. Musical glowworm, glowbug, and glow butterfly, each sold separately from Hasbro Preschool. Ugh, oh, good night, glowworm. I love you. Wake me up before it comes back on. <laughs> I hope you don't mind that I will wake you up with this crazy spider puppet with a action figure on top of it. <laughs> no, it's not really a spider. It's just a sectar, which is almost <laughs> as creepy as a real spider. <laughs> An experiment fails. 
creating a strange new race, the Sectors. Leading the forces of good is night-fighting Dargon with his telebunded glow-in-the-dark insectoid paraflies. So what about air raiders? Because the power is in the air. And when you hear that theme song, how could, I mean, how could you feel like stressed out when you hear air that? Air raiders, the power <laughs> is in the air. <laughs> and then when the song ends the kid's like flying away from you and he's like grabbing at you it's like the, it's a terrifying image but like with this really peaceful song behind it Boy, talk about, talk about cognitive and it history. all took place in airlandia <laughs> but in airlandia the tyrants of wind control the air and only a band of heroic air raiders has the power to stop them. Fighting for air against the tyrants of wind. The incredible new Air Raiders. It's coming soon from the makers of G.I. Joe, Air Raiders. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they put that to a focus group. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, now that those commercials are over, I guess it's time to get back to the plan at hand here. And back at the Ark, Ratchet is telling Prime that Mirage was gone from the repair bay when he went to check on him. What a good doctor. He's <laughs> probably been gone like a couple hours, and Ratchet's like, oh, I guess I should check on Mirage again. <laughs> Come on, he's got a lot to do in that place. I mean, Teletran 1 was probably broken six times since Mirage was repaired. Because Bumblebee's trying to make a new robot, Wheeljack's trying to make a new robot, and they're just <laughs> smashing up. What do they smash up? Teletran 1. <laughs> <laughs> well, just then, Cliffjumper returns, eager to inform them all about what Mirage has been up to. Prime warns him again, but Cliffjumper is certain of Mirage's guilt. But always fair Prime is going to hear Mirage's side of the story. That is, as soon as they retrieve the electrocell generator from Megatron. So the three roll out. This is the other scene in this episode where I consulted a dictionary. Because Optimus says, I warned you about making unfounded allegations, Cliff Jumper. Mm. And I was like, what's an unfounded allegation? You know, it, <laughs> I do remember taping this episode because I rewound it a couple times to try to figure out what words was he saying there. Mm. You know, and I, and I recorded on SLP, which is foolish me because now the audio is <laughs> not that great. So like, but I had to look up both words like unfounded. OK, that means like it's not based on fact. Allegation is oh, it's kind of like an a accusation. It's sort of like that. OK, now I now I understand what he's saying. <laughs> not that I couldn't infer that from the context of what they're talking about but it's like i needed to know they're not just for selling toys kids they're for improving vocabulary well i want to highlight those things because like one of the things that i think a lot of people who like to approach these shows with a little bit of a snarky eye is they it, i feel like there's a a baked in bit of the argument that these writers were just hacking it in which i can't say that for sure i wasn't there but I sense when I see things like that, I get the sense that, no, I think these are people doing their level best to make really good entertainment. And mm -hmm. yes, there were profound pressures on them from a variety of sources that complicated the matter. But I personally don't think anybody showed up going like, eh, what are we what are we doing some for kids? I guess so. We can just like put a dumb thing in it. Who cares? Because kids don't <laughs> care. Because kids do care. And kids are, you know, like to say that kids only like dumb things is another way of saying that kids are dumb. And I don't like that attitude. So mm -hmm. I, I, I like highlighting this whenever I can to say like, look, these people were trying and there was good stuff in here so yeah i mean if anything went all cartoons would be equally popular and you know <laughs> we would just all be sitting there dumb going that was good you know but we had preferences we had taste we had things that we liked things that we didn't like shows that we never wanted to see yeah well we cut back to the decepticon and insecticon battle where a bombshell has mirage fire a missile at thundercracker <laughs> it hits him square in the chest <laughs> <laughs> I just love how like how much better a fighter Mirage is now that Bombshell is controlling him. <laughs> and don't forget, there's like the added complication of he has to be given verbal commands, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so like there's like this added like little bit of buffer time between when he t <laughs> picks his target and then attacks his target. But yeah, what what is what is Thundercracker doing there? <laughs> <laughs> we see it like Thundercracker's about to shoot, and then. And we see this missile coming at him, and it literally like just hits him in the chest area, and then he like he like holds his chest. He's like, "Ow!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's like all, it's it's all orange where he got hit, right? He's like, <laughs> it, it's kind of abstracted, and so it doesn't you don't have the gore of of transformer flesh getting burnt and rended, but. 
but still, it's like it's clear that he was injured from that. But yeah, I do like he's like ah, <laughs> he, he turns away. This gives Bombshell a good chuckle until Megatron appears behind him, commenting on Bombshell's new toy, Mirage. A new toy, Bombshell? Too bad you're not going to have long to play with it. So, two Energon cubes were enough for you. Now you want to steal our Electro Cells. The cubes were enough, but you stole them from us. What gives you that absurd idea? A Decepticon insignia lying right where our Energon cubes have been. So that's what happened to... This Autobot ripped it off during the battle. I know this will be difficult for you, Bombshell, but think. Put two and two together, and it will equal an Autobot trick. You wouldn't cheat us. You need us to get rid of the Autobots. Maybe after that you'll rob us blind, but not now. Decepticons! Put down your weapons! Insecticons, cease combat! So now, unfortunately, Megatron has seen through Mirage's plan. As proven in the past, Megatron gets up too early in the morning to fall for many dippy Autobot plans. But he did fall for this one for a little while, so kudos to Mirage. Well, to Mirage's credit, it didn't involve dressing up Autobots in lab coats. <laughs> right. Way to go, Wind Charger. Good plan. <laughs> There's also that nice line where Megatron says, I know this will be difficult for you. Very <laughs> condescending. Mm -hmm. Frank Walker's performance as Megatron, I think one of the reasons it's so darn memorable is that I would love to interview him about this to find out like whether this was intentional, but he never slips into telegraphing smarminess, right? Mm. He, he just does it in his regular voice. I know this will be difficult for you, but think, you know, <laughs> uh, he doesn't do like, because Galvatron would be like much more like, I know this will be difficult for you. He would have <laughs> the, the, the smarm would make its way through, but Megatron mm. is above smarm, but not a, above sarcasm, if that makes sense. Mm. That line always stuck with me too as a kid. And it's not super clever, but it's just clever enough to make an 11 year old feel like, oh, they're clever because they got it. You know? <laughs> But let's pause here for a second to note something. Okay. So Megatron knew about Skywarp's missing Decepticon signal, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so I can only imagine there was a scene where Skywarp just happens by Megatron, and Megatron's <laughs> like, excuse me, you're out of uniform. <laughs> the handbook dictates every Decepticon brandish at least two Decepticon signals at all times. This is going to come up on your performance review. Oh, I, don't, I like the idea of like Skywarp being like, huh, what? Oh, what? <laughs> My wing, you know? And everybody else is like, oh, Skywarp, you're such a slob. You seen his room? <laughs> yeah, it's like that too. <laughs> it's a bunch of Danzig posters and ripped up furniture. <laughs> Hey, that's my room. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Megatron does. He's like, he's like, so that's what happened. <laughs> so like, he did know about the signal getting ripped off. Right. And we have established that Megatron is all about cleanliness because he had that vacuum mm -hmm. cleaner tube that came out of his chest in one episode. <laughs> yep. So tidiness. Tidiness You can matters. never get anything past Megatron. He knows all. <laughs> and speaking of knowing all, now the Insecticons know that they were deceived by Mirage. So Bombshell goes to execute him, only to be stopped by Megatron. Why destroy a perfectly good slave when I have a plan to use him to finish all the Autobots? Hear me out. I love that delivery of the final bit there. Hear me out. <laughs> Man. So it just it reminds me of there was some ability in the Palladium Heroes Unlimited series where you could roll, I think it was a 10 sided die. And it was like if you got over seven or eight on the 10 sided die, your character could shout a single command in a room and like that <laughs> percentage would respond without thinking. <laughs> it was like a charisma roll, if I remember right. It's been a long time since I played it. Somebody will correct me on it. Four million years later at gmail.com. <laughs> but I remember using it a lot when we played. It's like there was this sort of like you could issue a like a, a short command and you roll your percentage die and that percentage would automatically respond. And I feel like Megatron was using that voice. It's like <laughs> radio announcer voice or like sportscaster announcer or, or well, the let's get ready to rumble guy or something <laughs> like that, right? It's like, hear me out. Whoa, okay. Yeah, I'm listening. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I was flipping through my phone just now, but I'm listening now. Here, yes, Megatron, <laughs> I will hear you. 
but we cut back to Prime, Ratchet, and Cliffjumper arriving here, finding the Decepticon generator evacuated. Mirage appears and explains what happened. Though he's under Bombshell's control, he tells them the truth about tricking the Insecticons into battling the Decepticons. But he claims the Insecticons retreated and the Decepticons then gave chase, giving them an opportunity to now retrieve the Electrocell generator. Cliftemper still smells a trap, but Prime is willing to check it out. We should note here that Mirage is speaking absolutely normally. Mm -hmm. This is like very different from Transport to Oblivion in that, remember when Bumblebee's memory mm -hmm. chips got messed up? Mm -hmm. And he's like, the cave is off the highway. <laughs> and they're like, Bumblebee's never wrong, Prime. That's what he said. <laughs> but this, this feels more like it's keeping us a little bit like it's it's keeping a little bit more ambiguity. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. we know that he's under bombshell's control, but he's talking normally. So is he a traitor? I don't know. <laughs> so because they could have done that thing where they want to make sure little kids get it. Like, oh, uh, you know, Prime, they are over there. We don't <laughs> need to worry. We can go home. <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't do that. He talks no. like normal Mirage. So, so Mirage leads them all down the valley. And right into a trap where all the Decepticons fire upon them. <laughs> Cliff Temper shouts that he knew it was a trap as Mirage transforms and also fires on the Autobots. Oh, Cliff Jumper, don't be that guy. We, <laughs> we heard you the whole episode. <laughs> <laughs> Cliff Temper zooms around and takes him, throwing Mirage around and down to the ground. Then Bombshell runs up to the fallen Mirage, trying to get him back to fighting. But Ratchet fires on Bombshell, sending the Insecticon fleeing deciding that Mirage has served his purpose anyway. And then while tending to Mirage, Ratchet discovers the Cerebro shell on Mirage's head just as Prime runs up. Then they both realize that Mirage was being controlled by, quote, one of Bombshell's Cerebro shells. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now this is interesting, because we've never seen Bombshell use Cerebro shells before, mm -hmm. but the Autobots are clearly familiar with them. So there's probably an unseen Insecticon adventure that we never got to see that factored in this ability of bombshells as well as putting the Insecticons on slightly better terms with the Decepticons than last we saw. Or at least continuity demands this. So Hoover explains it all. For those of us who were like <laughs> those of us who were going like, but how could they know about the Cerebro shells? It makes no sense. <laughs> it was like, don't worry. It's a lost episode. It's fine. I'm like, oh, 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 my medication. Uh, I, another thing I love, there's a lot of subtle things in this episode that I think like do really good modeling of, again, this idea that I get hooked on is that Autobots have functional or relationships that inspire growth and change and, and health, whereas the Decepticons are dysfunctional and they never fix it, is once they take the shell off of Mirage's head and you hear Ratchet explain to Prime what it is, you see Cliffjumper going like, so Mirage wasn't a traitor, but he doesn't say anything to Mirage yet, right? He's like, he's, right. he's, he's drinking in. And then, so before Cliffjumper can act on that, Optimus models the correct behavior, which says, it's over, Mirage, forget it. Now, I don't know about you when you were a child, but it was really difficult for me when I was like 10 or 11 to get over when I screwed something up. Like, I made some dumb mistakes. Like, I... like. I made some super dumb mistakes when I was 11 years old, right? And in some cases, like, there was damage to property or, like, a friend got hurt. I didn't, I didn't knock anybody off a barn or anything, but, you know. <laughs> but there was always, like, you make mistakes like that when you're a little kid. And, like, it's really difficult to realize that, like, okay, as long as you don't do that again, as long as you learn from that mistake, it'll be okay. But it, it's a hard thing to wrap your little 10-year-old brain around because you don't have that mm -hmm. context yet. So to have the dad transformer say, forget it. We, we've all forgotten it. It's over. Don't think about it anymore. And the fact that he did that, and then so that Cliff Jumper can have the time that we have left in the episode to like dwell on this, mm -hmm. I think is really, really well played. I mean, I think this is, again, writing entertainment for young people. As I watch that, I'm like, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Put a gold star on that. Yeah. So. So this realization is actually enough to convince Cliff Jumper, as Mirage explains, he never wanted to betray his fellow Autobots. <laughs> and then Prime instructs Ratchet to get. Mirage back on his feet. Prime plans to run up and grab the Electrocells himself as the other Autobots supply cover fire. 
cool shot here of Optimus sliding down the hill from behind too. <laughs> they all start firing and Optimus like runs around in the front of the camera and then runs off to the right and then starts sliding down the hill and just like you see the smoke coming up in the air as the like the foreground hill obscures him. But it's it's cool looking. <laughs> In the meantime, all the Decepticons and Insecticons have all lined up in front of the generator. <laughs> we even see a reflector robot among them. And they're all returning fire on the Autobots. Now, always knowing what Prime is up to, Megatron runs back inside to head him off. Prime then heads off Megatron while the other three Autobots have somehow followed him in <laughs> and surrounded Megatron as well. Yeah, this, this feels like, oh, oh, really? We only got like three minutes left of the episode? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the Autobots went outside. <laughs> <laughs> and then Megatron proclaims that if he can't have the Electro Cells, no one can, as he repeatedly fires upon his own machinery, sending the Autobots running. Now, as the large device starts exploding, we see all three Reflector robots caught in a blast as yeah. the Insecticons shout, Retreat! And the Autobots roll out as well. So there's a piece of animation here where Megatron... So Megatron literally just starts strafing the building with his mm -hmm. fusion cannon. And at one point, they cut to... As they're showing the Autobots getting knocked around, and you see the three reflector robots get blown up in the exploding machinery. It cuts back to Megatron, and like they sped up the animation. Like where he's like he's firing really fast. I don't mm -hmm. know if he does this, but it looks like Benny Hill kind of thing going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's like murderous Benny Hill. Da, 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 da. As Megatron's blowing up everything. He'll do the whole business of, like, if he, if I can't have it, nobody can. But he usually does that by flying away and transforming into Soundwave's hand. Like, blow up the place, Soundwave, over mm -hmm. my will. But this time he's standing right in the middle of it and yep. shooting up the place. Yeah. And so the Autobots roll out, and we cut back to Megatron, who's on the ground, lamenting the loss of his electro cells. He's surrounded by flames and explosions. And he chokes out a bit more complaints before seemingly passing out. We see like his head sink to the ground. Yeah, he's like, he's like they belong to me. <laughs> and then, he, then he's just down. It's like a drone shot pulling back out as mm -hmm. we pull away from the scene, seeing uh, everything in ruins. <laughs> <laughs> and then we cut back to Autobot HQ, where Prime is apologizing to the two scientists from the episode's beginning. They lament the loss of the Electro Cells, but are glad Megatron wasn't able to use them for his evil plans. Then we cut to the repair bay where Ratchet is fixing up Mirage, fixing the hole in his head made by the Cerebro shell. And Cliffjumper bursts in, saying, Hey, Mirage, I have just one thing to say to you. Yeah? What, Cliffjumper? Move over! Hey, what's up? <laughs> I, I, I think I have a hole in my head that needs repairing, too! You what? <laughs> and the pair literally roll off the examining table as Ratchet laughs at the antics. So Cliffjumper has finally learned to trust Mirage, at least in his own way, he, and he admitted that he was wrong, without actually apologizing in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> yeah, he he didn't actually, yes, he doesn't say the words, I apologize, but I do really like, I mean, the, the whole business of him, like, like sort of jumping on Mirage, they start, they like, tumble off the table and roll around on the floor together is super weird, and it confused <laughs> me as a child, and it confuses me as an adult, although, you know, like, as a kid with a brother who is, like, basically your age, so he's two years younger than me, like, yeah, we, we were almost always wrestling, uh, mm -hmm. even though I wasn't a very, like, you know, physical kid. Like, we always wound up doing that at some point or another. But I like the fact that Cliff Jumper at the end is laughing at himself. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, that's that's a really cool thing to model for young people, too, is the fact that, yeah, he doesn't come out and say, like, he's not doing the sheepish, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have right. done that. He's doing yeah. the whole, like, yeah, you know what, Mirage, I am an idiot. I'm a <laughs> big, dumb idiot. I have a hole in my head that needs repairing, you know? Yeah. Which, you know, that's another kind of apology. And that's a, and it's showing the young people part of the reason we get worked up about these things is that we are taking ourselves so darn seriously sometimes. Mm -hmm. And if they're really our friends, they'll forgive us as long as we're honest. So, yeah. But they didn't say it. They don't come out and say that. They demonstrate it, right? Mm -hmm. Like He-Man episode, they would have said it. He-Man would have looked right. right at the camera and said it. <laughs> <laughs> or King Randor or Man-at-Arms or Tila would have looked right at you and said like that exact line. But Yeah, and then they would have reiterated it in the moral at the end. It's like, in today's story, <laughs> yeah. I needed to say I was sorry. Yes, they totally would have done that. 
<laughs> and don't get me wrong, that stuff works on me like a tonic too. But I do want to congratulate them for doing something that I think does the same thing in a slightly more sophisticated way, in a way that I don't want to say it sails over the kids' heads, but I think it hits them in some kind of visceral way. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of times when we say it sails over a kid's head, I think what we're really saying, what we're trying to say is that it bypasses their reason and hits them right in the heart, mm. right? And, and 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 which is what I think like really good poetry does, and I think like really good comics does it too. It's like you're not noticing it's happening. Something that happens to me a lot ever since I started seriously investigating this whole idea of what story is as part of my career as a cartoonist is that I notice that it gets harder for me to fully get lost in a story because I'm so busy looking for the points of anticipation. When are you teeing up something for a payoff for me later? Mm-hmm. And it just becomes a habit for you to look for it, right? And so when I get lost in it and the story just starts hitting me and suddenly I'm feeling like big feelings because I'm in the story now is it's a it's kind of comparatively a rarer thing. And when it happens, I really, really love it when it happens. And I feel like that's when the the, the artists have constructed the poetry in just such a way as they've done an end run around my reason and hit me right in the feelings. Does that make yeah. sense? Mm hmm. Yep. It's almost like they were sneaking by invisibly. <laughs> Your reason just couldn't see it. <laughs> they might be sending the message home if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you feel about this one? So this one this one is really good. I really like it. it. Aside from having some really great animation, I feel the plot is nicely complex and it reads reads as more young adult level than intermediate level. Yeah. Because I mean they could have easily made this one way more heavy handed. Like, mm-hmm. Mirage could have, like, telegraphed every single thing he did rather than leave it up for the viewer to interpret. Yeah, yeah. They left it. You could tell what, what side he's on the whole time. But, like, they left it just ambiguous enough that an 11-year-old might be mm-hmm. um, might be bait and switched by it, yeah. right? Yeah, there were a lot of twists and turns and fake outs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, on top of that, we have some top-notch characterization. Clearly, they referred to the tech spec bios, unlike a lot of episodes. <laughs> Plus, they have Prime constantly be fair and give anyone the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. They portray Megatron as the greedy child who wants the thing so bad he'll destroy it if he can't have it. And they even squeeze in Starscream, objecting to his plan, having it blow up in his face, literally, causing Megatron to almost shoot him. Kickback's even given a smidge of character beyond making foot-related puns. That's true. (laughs) <laughs> Thundercracker and Skywarp each get a tiny scene, even though Thundercracker's only line is, ah! <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really couldn't ask for much more from this episode unless I could like magically increase the runtime and get more of all this great stuff. Yeah. So it's, it's not my absolute favorite episode so far. Maybe not even top five, but it's really well done. Yeah. And what a bummer to learn that these two writers never did another Transformers episode. It checks off a lot of once in an episode for me. Like, you know, I go in with these boxes like, well, is Skywarp going to say anything? Is Thundercracker going to say anything? Is Starscream going to object to Megatron's plan? You know, it's like I have these boxes that I like instinctively check off as I watch an episode. And mm-hmm. this checked off so many boxes. Yeah. Provides character growth for Cliff Jumper, And it's nicely balanced between the good guys and bad guys, which a lot of times we don't get. Yeah. So I always did like this one, but analyzing it now, it really deserves all the accolades I can give it. I can't really put my finger on a single complaint about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's interesting to me that we both walked away from Heavy Metal War going like, eh, it's okay. It's okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some real like issues with it. And, like, and that's one that I held in such high esteem in my youth. Like, that's a classic episode. Mm-hmm. And then... Yeah, the traitor's like, yeah, it was a good episode. I remember when it came out and it had some funny parts. But now I watch, I'm like, yeah, dang, this thing is rock solid. This is like, this should be sort of like a baseline for a lot of future Transformers writers. Like, okay, if you're going to write an episode, do this. Like, follow, Mm -hmm. not like recipe style, check all these boxes necessarily all in that order. But think about these things as sort of restraints to like build your story within. And I just can't get over how darned good this episode is for young people, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that every episode should teach children something or necessarily be like guiding and instructing. I mean, it is an entertainment. No, but if you can work that into a good entertaining story, 
You know, it's just like the icing on top of the cake. Well, I mean, inherently in a good versus evil story, inherently there's a morality tale sort of suggested. We are suggesting by saying these people are good, these people are evil. Therefore, good people need to model the sort of cultural assumptions and mores and, and you know, guided behavior that we all put under the bucket of good behavior. And the bad guys should model what we call bad behavior, you know. And bad behavior, like, I think like, we smell a bad story when the bad behavior is just like, I hate everybody. <laughs> I want to destroy, you know. Well, mm-hmm. That means something, but it's not as good as if you can get something a little bit more more complex and nuanced in there. And I think that's why we get so excited about the Insecticons, where it's like, well, they're bad guys, but they're not just like greedy tyrants and despots. You know, it's like they're just like mm-hmm. they're sort of like just outside the law. Yeah. <laughs> they're sort of neutral, you know, yeah. and neutrality can be good and it can also be bad. Right. Like the Insecticons. So. <laughs> So, yeah, it's just, it's, those guys were, they knew what they were doing in this one. Everything came together really well. And then plus they got really lucky with their animation because I don't know how this one would have done had they done it with the animators from City of Steel. Yeah, that's true. Because a lot of the scenes like really sing because of the way it was shot. You know, mm-hmm. like when, when Cliff Jumper bangs into Starscream's chest in car mode, it looks fantastic. Yeah. And when Optimus goes sliding down that hill, it's like Ratchet, you know, Cliff Jumper, Mirage, cover me. I'm going in for the electro cells. It just looks, it's like two seconds of animation, but it just looks so good. It just makes the exciting stuff feel that much more exciting. Yeah. So, so if you haven't watched The Traitor in a while, highly recommend it. It's a good, solid Transformers adventure. Mm-hmm. And touching on something you spoke about a moment ago, it seems like a lot of how we remember liking something when we were younger, it seems more based on the plot. Like, mm-hmm. for example, how you said we remembered liking Heavy Metal War pretty well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, remembered this one is just being sort of okay, but it sort of flipped once we watched them. Mm-hmm. It seems like our memory is just like, okay, what happened in Heavy Metal War? Oh, that was where Prime and Megatron fought and Megatron stole all the powers. So it's like we're almost basing our likes on sort of the plot more so than the details. And now that we're watching for the details, we're sort of like finding different results. Yeah, yeah. Because we're, I mean, it's it's like reading for enjoyment or reading for the test, right? Because like we're mm. also watching this with the intent of communicating what we're getting out of it and, and formalizing those thoughts, right? Mm-hmm. So that's going to change the way we engage with it. So that's something to bear in mind as well, is that mm-hmm. like, just because we go like, well, heavy metal war has some problems it, that shouldn't, I don't think that should unduly affect anybody's enjoyment of it. First of all, right. enjoy what you want to enjoy. You know, we're, we're just two dudes talking about this stuff and I would never presume to tell anybody else how to live their life. No. But it, it's, it's a different watching experience if you're looking at it for the purpose of sort of forming an informal essay out of mm-hmm. what you experienced and, and really like critiquing it. I guess that's what we're doing. We're critiquing these episodes as well yeah. in a loving way. I mean, if you're, if you're only going by like the IMDb log line, Heavy Metal War does sound better than this episode, but it's just not the case. And Heavy Metal War has some truly magical moments in it, right? Mm-hmm. Like some very yeah. memorable, great looking shots. Yeah, we talked about it a lot in that episode, right? But so, yeah. I'm actually really looking forward to more surprises like this as we go mm-hmm. down the list. Yeah. I mean, am I going to get to the master builders and be like, this is a really great episode. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, it, who could be like, it could be, it wind up being this, like this heartfelt sort of love note to art. <laughs> that, mm-hmm. Like as, as an adult who struggled with his art his whole life is like, wow, that really resonates with me. But as an 11 year old who just thinks like, well, you just like talented people just draw. That's all. I'm like, why, why are you wasting my time with 21 minutes talking about art? Just show me the cool fights. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's 49 episodes in season two. So there are guaranteed to be some that I just don't remember. Like I said before, like that I've only seen like five times or whatever. Yeah. In my yeah. life. Yeah. So I really look forward to those, those little hidden gems that we discover along the way. So speaking of which, what do we got next? Next is the immobilizer. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it like Wheeljack. <laughs> the immobilizer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you're watching on Tubi, this is very early in their order of season two episodes. So you'll have to go backwards. Hmm. But this this one features the first appearance of another puny flesh creature who becomes a sort of series regular. So, Oh, exciting. 
another human to help make the Autobots make better choices. That's I, I'm, I'm, that's my hypothesis. I'm sticking to it. We'll see if it sticks in the Immobilizer, the next episode of Four Million Years Later. This is the part where I say thank you for downloading and listening. Thank you, Hoover, for this awesome discussion of Transformers. And Thank uh, you, Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> we record the show weekly. You can download it usually on Thursdays at 4millionyearslater.com or your favorite podcatcher. If you're listening in your favorite podcatcher and it has one of those review systems, a neat thing you could do is just give us a five-star review. I think we deserve it. Um, mm-hmm. If you really want to go the extra mile, if you want to give us an extra Energon reward, more than two <laughs> cubes. You can... I'd say two is pretty good, though. <laughs> well, five-star review would be pretty good. But <laughs> but if you, if you really want to go the extra distance, you can write a few sentences about just like three things you like about the show. That helps more people find the show. See, it's a free thing. You do well, free in the sense it doesn't cost you money, but it does cost you time. But it helps more people discover the show. So thanks to everybody who has been doing that. It means a lot to us. And It certainly does. Until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of 4millionyearslater.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Hoover. And now's the part where Jersey jumps onto my lap and we laugh and roll, <laughs> roll off the around. table. okay bye bye episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net the closing theme is by nick mahalik based on the original closing theme by ford kinder and ann bryant you can find more of nick's music at soundcloud.com slash nicholas dash mahalik that's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com Visit 4 Million Years Later dot com and if you haven't yet please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts you know how it works <laughs> <laughs>